everyone and welcome back to my channel. Today's video is going to be a little bit more on the serious side. As you know, November is Alzheimer's Awareness Month and today I thought I would share a paper that I wrote for my English class last semester. I used my Nana's life as you know, my reference point. My goal was to sort of deconstruct her life and see what traumatic events could have contributed to her Alzheimer's uh, since some studies show that traumatic events can contribute to Alzheimer's being a diagnosis. This is a little long, so I'm hoping that I can get through all of it without getting emotional because I haven't read it out loud before. I've read it to myself many times and I've shared it to with a few people. Um, I'll also be inserting pictures so you're not just looking at my face. It's been said that the eyes are the window to the soul. A person's eyes can tell us so much about them. My Nana Bernice had the most beautiful blue eyes, which complemented her dark hair very well. She was extremely active given her age. She would still go up on the roof with the leaf blower to blow leaves off the roof, travel with her husband Raymond on pipelining jobs, and still had time to go to her weekly hair appointments. However, the light in her eyes began to dim in the mid-1990s, and even more so in 2000 came around when she started to go downhill rather quickly. Nana had been diagnosed with early onset Alzheimer's, the most common form of dementia. It grew from early onset to full-blown Alzheimer's within 10 to 15 years. It's difficult to say what exactly causes dementia. Kate Kaur mentions in the Unforgettable blog that going through something traumatic such as divorce or being in an abusive relationship can be a contributing factor. Nana had both of these events happen in her life with her first husband and I wondered if it contributed to her fate. On a more scientific note, clumps of protein will show up in brain scans for different forms of dementia. In a study led by Johannes Atems, the proteins on a brain with Alzheimer's are called amyloid and tau. In dementia with Lewy bodies, those proteins are called alpha seneculine. Lewy bodies, according to the Mayo Clinic, are the protein deposits that go after motor control, which are the same things that will attack patients with Parkinson's disease. These various types of protein deposits are what will slowly cause the brain to die. If the eyes are in fact the window to the soul, then dementia is the entity that closes it. In my personal experience dealing with this awful disease, I've seen two forms of dementia. My Nana Bernice had Alzheimer's, and my great grandma had what I suspected to have been vascular dementia, which is not Alzheimer's, but the second most common form of dementia according to Tipa Snow, a dementia care and education specialist. Dementia in a nutshell is brain failure. Marcus McGill states that it's not known if dementia causes brain cell death or if brain cell death causes dementia. Granny would have what they told me as a child, episodes. These episodes that she was experiencing were transient ischemic attacks or TIA or mini strokes. Everything would seem normal. A conversation would be going on like any other day. Then out of nowhere, she would start a sentence and trail off, often slurring or forgetting words, sometimes forgetting what the conversation was even about or where she was. As stated by Connie Chow and the editorial team at Daily Caring, vascular dementia is brought on by lack of blood flow to the brain, usually from a stroke or a series of strokes. Nana didn't have a history of physical brain trauma or reversible factors such as thyroid abnormalities or vitamin deficiencies, which are potential causes for dementia according to Marcus McGill. Regardless of the lack of evidence, she ended up having Alzheimer's and would have had to go through extensive testing with a neurologist to come to that conclusion. With Granny having her many strokes, it was easier to diagnose her with dementia when she started having problems problems. As the strokes occurred more frequently, it was getting scary to have her living alone. My great-grandpa had passed away in 1995, so she had been living by herself for close to 10 years when she was diagnosed. My dad's parents moved in with her for a while to help take care of her. Once that became too stressful, they brought in round-the-clock care until that became too much. Ultimately, they decided to sell her house and put her in a nursing home. Granny was always a pistol even before her dementia diagnosis, so she had a bit of a mean streak in her when she was being taken care of by somebody else, and it didn't matter who it was. One thing she was adamant about was that she had two houses that were exactly the same. Her husband worked for Bellows Construction, where he would design houses. He even helped design and build two of their own houses while they lived in the hill country. At first we thought she believed these two separate houses were the same. However, my aunt pointed out that in the 1980s, the city changed all the house numbers for the emergency services. The original address was 275 and they changed it to 308. We just had to go along with it that she had two houses that were exactly the same or she would get upset with us. Something else that would happen with my great grandma was that she would forget all the time that her husband had passed away. Reminding dementia patients of certain realities, especially death, is not a good idea. It's called reality orientation. Tipa Snow says it's not something that's done anymore because it doesn't help. If it's a death that they're being reminded of, they tend to grieve the death as if it had just happened, which can be additional trauma. One Easter we went to see her and take her an Easter lily. She was sitting in the main lobby area when we walked in and she was shocked when she saw us. What? Who? 
How did you find me here? She was completely flustered. Patients with dementia of all times can go back to certain periods of time, making it hard for their caretakers to figure out what part of life they are currently in. I was only 14, but since I had been through this with Nana, I thought I'd give it a try. I said, well, Granny, where do you think you're going? I was thinking maybe she thinks she's at a doctor's office or running errands. Let's see where she needs to go next. She said, Susie, that's my cousin's name. She has short red hair, and at the time I had cut my hair short and dyed it red. So that day I was Susie. Your grandpa and I are going to Vegas for the weekend and he is running late. Granny used to work for an airline in Houston, Texas, so they flew to various places, but mostly Vegas at the drop of a hat. I had to think of something really fast. So I said, oh, Granny, I just got off the phone with him before we left. He was finishing a round of golf. He said he would be right over. He should be here any minute. She scoffed and said, ugh, he's always out there playing that damn game. She let us keep her company until grandpa came. Nana's case, however, was a mystery. Where did this come from? What caused it? There wasn't a history of dementia in the family, so why was it starting with her? This is where some of the personal trauma she experienced may have come into play, and to evaluate that suspicion, I needed to go as far back as I could. Nana was born to Norwegian parents in July of 1922 in North Dakota. Seven years later, the stock market crashed and the Great Depression took over the country. This experience carried into her adult life and even bled into my mom's life. Nana was always frugal with money because of the depression since that is how her mother was in order to survive. Grandma was so deeply affected that she wouldn't even throw out a spoonful of vegetables. Instead, she would put them in the fridge and save them. My mom told me once that she tried to throw away some ice cubes down the drain and grandma said, no, you need to put that in the freezer. You can use that again. Nana took after grandma pinching her pennies and stretching money farther than anybody I've ever seen. In June of 1941, she married her first husband and my mom's biological father. We'll call him Stubb. She had two sons with him, one in 1942 and one in 1945. In 1960, Nana thought she might have something wrong with her and made an appointment with her doctor. She was 38 years old and had been sick when she was pregnant with the two boys. Boys, so pregnancy didn't cross her mind as a reason for her missed periods and other symptoms. They did exploratory surgery on her to see what could be wrong, only to find out that she was in fact pregnant. Surprise! My mom, Brenda, named after the singer Brenda Lee, was born in 1961. That's 16 years after the younger of the two brothers was born. Two years later, in August of 1963, Nana divorced Stubb after 22 years of marriage. There's a big life event that could cause trauma divorce. After the divorce, Nana was a single mom working as a waitress in a diner. One night, one of her girlfriends wanted to go out to a dance hall and invited Nana to go with her. Mom was only two years old at the time, so Nana said, I can't go. I have Brenda at home. They asked if one of my mom's older brothers could watch her because Nana really needed a night out. They went out and she met a tall, handsome man named Ray, a pipelining supervisor who was in Oregon on a job. He asked her to dance. When they started dancing, he asked her, do you know how to do the barnyard shuffle? He must have made an impression because shortly after that night, they started dating. And in September of 1964, they were married and relocated back to the hill country in Texas where Ray was from. I put it together when I was 10 years old that Papa was not my mom's real father since he had a different last name, but he was more of a father to her than Stubb ever was. On one family skiing trip, I decided to ask my uncle what kind a person he was. He died before I was born and didn't have much to do with my mom once Nana divorced him. He had only talked to her a handful of times, not enough to form any kind of bond. My uncle said he was a mean drunkard who not only verbally abused Nana, but was also physically abusive. He told me one story in particular where he went to break them up because he was either already hitting or was about to hit her in the face. Nana had started dinner and had the stove on. Whatever they were arguing about escalated into a screaming match and Stubb went to hit her. My uncle got in front of Nana to protect her and Stubb told him to move. He said, no, you need to leave mother alone. Stubb, who didn't like him to begin with and also didn't like being told what to do by his own son, took his hand and held it on top of the stove and burned him. The life my Nana had before she met my papa was full of traumatic events. The amount of abuse she dealt with for 22 years with Stubb must have taken a toll on her mental health on top of going through and surviving the depression. She always had to work really hard to keep the family together since Stubb drank their money away. It was a fight or flight situation and Nana decided to fight until she couldn't anymore. Once she met Ray, her entire lifestyle changed. She was able to relax and just be. They were traveling all over the country where she got to meet new people and make new friends. When they weren't traveling, she was always a good housewife and liked being outside doing things in the yard like leaf blowing and keeping up with her massive garden. She started to forget little things in the late 1980s and would get frustrated that she couldn't remember. Around 1993, my mom took her to a neurologist she knew in Austin to have her checked out. The doctors didn't want to say Alzheimer's because normally Alzheimer's is officially diagnosed at post-mortem, 
so he just said it's dementia. They didn't tell Nana because they didn't think she would understand what that meant. In the beginning, Nana was fine. She was still able to drive, be home alone, and do normal things like go to her weekly hair appointments and play solitaire, even though she would cheat. That all changed with one incident. One day in the mid-1990s, she was on her way to her weekly hair appointment like she always did. There's an intersection known as Fuzzy's Corner to the locals. Nana only needed to turn left once she left the house as her hairdresser was in the same town. Instead, she turned right and kept going until she arrived at Fuzzy's Corner, and then she turned left. She didn't recognize where she was and pulled into a little restaurant. I presume she thought it was her hairdresser's building. She walked in and was very confused. The lucky thing about the whole situation is her stepson was having lunch there with some friends. He saw her walk in and must have seen a puzzled look on her face. He got up and said, Mom, what are you doing here? She said, I, I don't know. He brought her home and called my mom. They met at the house to have a family meeting and my mom explained to her how scary that was. What if she had kept going? She could have gotten lost. This was a time before cell phones were a common item to have, so what if she had forgotten who to call? Nana, Nana told my mom she wouldn't drive anymore. That was a big deal because Nana loved to drive. She never even attempted to pick up the keys and drive away. The keys were always just left on the counter. She just never picked them up again. The agreement was if Papa wasn't around to take her where she needed to go, she would call Pat, the neighbor, to take her to her hair appointment, grocery store, or wherever. After a while, Nana needed to be placed in a nursing home. It was a hard decision, but it put everyone's minds at ease knowing she would be in a facility that would be able to take care of her. In the first nursing home, they took away her toothbrush, makeup, things she would do, her hair, everything. These items were part of her routine, and when they took that away from her, she almost became lost and started to go downhill. When a patient with any form of dementia loses something, a routine, skill, etc., there's nothing you can do to get it back. Mom ended up moving her to a nursing home in the next town where they took excellent care of her. We were able to sign her out and take her to lunch, which we did once a week, or even bring her home for a while, like at Christmas. There were moments in those last few years that were heartbreaking and some that made you laugh. Those times will come with the disease. Knowing or not knowing how to react and handle it is what can make it hard on the family and or the caretakers. When Papa passed away in August of 2000, Mom decided to take Nana to see him in the funeral home. By this time, Nana had lost her ability to fully communicate. This is usually one of the last things to go. Most of her speech was gone, with the exception of a few words and phrases like damn bad when something hurt or hit it when we would be watching for a clear entrance to pull into traffic. The rest was just mumbling and humming. They walked up to the casket and Nana started rubbing Papa's head like she normally would. On the third or fourth touch, she stopped and looked at my mom with sad eyes and said, he's cold. She looked back at him and said, he's dead. She began to reach for the lid of the casket to close it because she wanted him to be warm and told my mom, we need to close this. Something that made us laugh and say, yeah, that's Nana was one of the nurses told us one morning they were having a music morning and one of the elderly men was confined to a wheelchair. They were playing country music and Nana loved country music thanks to Papa who was also a musician. She took the man in the wheelchair by the hands and started dancing with him while he sat. Rhythm is a retained skill in patients with Alzheimer's which is why many patients who are musically inclined and right-brained in general will still have the ability to dance, march, and will even retain the ability to sing even if their ability to speak isn't there. In January of 2003, she caught pneumonia. Knowing that this was probably going to be the time, my mom signed a DNR. It was really hard to see her laying in that hospital bed trying to breathe. Patients with dementia lose the ability to swallow. Catching pneumonia would make breathing really difficult and it will basically suffocate them. Luckily, Nana could always swallow her food thanks to adding chewing a piece of gum three times a day. So what ended up killing her was respiratory failure on February 3rd, 2003. We were really lucky with Nana. She was always really sweet and was never combative. That's not the case for every patient dealing with dementia. What people need to remember when dealing with loved ones with dementia is that they're still in there. They're just different. There's not a one size fits all dementia anymore and there certainly is not a one treatment kind of plan either. My cousin Susie who worked in a memory care unit at a nursing home in Austin has said, the people affected by this disease were once intelligent human beings doing extraordinary things. She's right. They could have been a novelist, an actor, a military veteran, a teacher, a musician. The list is literally endless. There are many facilities that have now formed treatment plans to help people with dementia from various backgrounds to help keep them engaged. Keeping them engaged in daily activities and keeping their minds active is what will help them the most. While they may resort at times to acting like a child, it is never okay to treat them that way. I could end this with a laundry list of do's and don'ts, but the most important thing we need to remember is that this did not happen to them by choice. We need to love them and treat them like we would want to be treated, like the person they were and who they are becoming.
So that was my paper that I wrote and I stumbled a little bit. I think I might have even mispronounced a few names and I'm sorry, but um, I hope this was somewhat educational. Um, if not, it was very personal for me to share all of this, but with it being Alzheimer's Awareness Month, I thought it was appropriate and I will see you guys in the next one. Bye.